Hello, good evening everyone. I hope that you all are doing fine. And uh, yeah, so we need to start with this topic today, which is the Braxism topic. And uh, you know, the Braxism is very, very common these days. And out of 100, I think around like 80 to 90% people are doing the Braxism because of the stress that they are living. Um, bruxism is repetitive teeth clenching, teeth grinding or bracing or thrusting of the mandible. It can occur during sleep or when awake. So it can happen at any time. But more common is the night time. The etiology of sleep bruxism is complex and multifactorial but is not fully understood. Uh, there is no evidence that occlusal factors cause sleep bruxism. In sleep bruxism, rhythmic masticatory muscle activity peaks in the minutes before rapid eye movement. So it is related to the uh, sleep movements. Okay, so it is uh, more complex. The reason why people do the sleep bruxism is very complex and uh, suggesting that its onset is related to sleep stage transition. Tooth grinding uh, during sleep, which is usually noted by a sleep partner. So it is uh, usually when patient comes to the clinic, they sometimes they are aware, but most of the times they are not aware that they are doing the uh, bruxism at, during the night time. So what we ask to the patient is, did your partner mention anything about the teeth grinding or teeth uh, clenching that you do during the uh, night time? However, in the sleep laboratory, approximately 50% of people with the history of tooth grinding have low frequencies of jaw muscle contraction and tooth grinding. Okay, if re it remains to be clarified when tooth grinding becomes a disorder associated with negative consequences such as tooth damage and pain. So when uh, anyone would do the tooth grinding, it would cause extra load on the tooth structure and that would also lead to pain around the joint area and the muscles would the muscles of mastications they would also become sore because they are continuously working not even at the night time they are relaxed so they would be sore when you will wake up in the morning and the normal load, the normal occlusal forces that happens to the teeth while we uh, eat anything or we use them, that's totally fine. They can bear that forces. But if there is any extra load of force which can be caused by these bruxism or clenching, our teeth would get more damaged. Bruxism may rarely be a sign of orofacial dyskinesia or occur following a head injury. So they are just discussing its causes, why it might be happening. Acute oromandibular dystonia or tardive dyskinesia caused by dopamine antagonist anti uh, emetic drugs, which is the metoclopramide, prochloro parazine or antipsychotic drugs may be mistaken for bruxism. So there are some uh, acute oromandibular dystonia or tardive dyskinesia which can be caused by these types of drugs which sometimes we uh, mistakenly take it as bruxism but it, that is a different thing. Okay, so box 17 lists common triggers of bruxism. So these are the common triggers that might uh, be one of the reasons why, why you are doing the bruxism. First of all is the caffeine intake or including herbal stimulants. So I just remembered this like there are two C's, caffeine and cocaine. Okay, and then there are uh, I think four A's, alcohol, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and amphetamines. Okay, then three S, which is the smoking, snoring, and sleep apnea, and stress. Sorry, four, um, four S. So two C, four A, four S. That would, could be the triggers for bruxism. What are two C's? Caffeine intake, cocaine intake, then A are alcohol, antidepressants, antipsychotic, amphetamines, 
smoking, snoring, sleep apnea, and stress and anxiety. Then how you can manage the bruxism? First, you need to find out what's the cause in your patient. Like if he is taking any medication that might leading to bruxism or he's uh, snoring or he's sleeping with the open mouth because he has obstructive sleep apnea or any stress in his life, you need to find out the cause. Then only you would be able to manage and to finding out the cause and to addressing any trigger, you will need multidisciplinary approach. Okay, you may need to involve their GP to help them with uh, dealing with the stress. You may need to involve the oral surgeon or the other specialist to uh, treat the obstructive sleep apnea. And so the, there are some, it is a multidisciplinary approach. Sleep bruxism can be managed by avoiding the risk factors, relaxation techniques, hypnotherapy, biofeedback, cognitive behavior therapy, and improving sleep hygiene. Management of awake bruxism requires habit recognition and reversal and stress management. There is no evidence of for so for sleep uh, bruxism we can try hypnotherapy, biofeedback, and cognitive behavioral therapy. But for awake bruxism, only you need to find the habit and reverse it and the stress management. There is insufficient evidence to support the use of drugs in the management of awake or sleep bruxism. Then for bruxism, as we read here, that we are giving the patient, sorry, not here, here, that we are giving the patient the custom made full coverage intraocclusal splint. So that would help the patient who are doing the bruxism by protecting their teeth and their uh, joint. Okay, so full coverage intraoral occlusal appliance, which is called as splints or the dental guards can be made used can be used to protect the teeth from atresion during sleep bruxism they should be custom made by a dentist with appropriate expertise or an oral medicine specialist regularly it should be reviewed and adjusted as required in addition to preventing tooth damage, intraoral occlusal appliances reduce muscle strain and loading to the TMJ. So this splint would help in protecting the teeth and would help uh, to avoid muscle getting sore and the joint getting any damage. However, they do not cure bruxism. Partial coverage splints should not be used because of the potential for significant occlusal changes and the risk of aspiration. Partial coverage should not be used, only the full coverage intraocclusal appliances should be used. Then trismus. It is an reduced ability to open the jaws. There are a number of potential causes, some of which are serious and warrant urgent treatment. So for the Christmas, I would recommend reading Odell case 8. Uh, you will get more insight about this topic. Okay, so you what could be the common causes of Christmas? First of all, if there is any problem in the TMD, which is uh, the TMD joint or the muscles. Okay, then temporomandibular joint derangement. It means internal derangement or external derangement. Then if there is any infection around the area, for example, pericoronitis, spreading odontogenic infection or peritonsillar abscess. Then if there was any surgery, after the surgery for wisdom tooth removal, there would be some trismus in that area. and if there is any hematoma following dental injection and most likely after an IEN block, it can lead to trismus. And if there is any tetanus or acute dystonic reactions, so oral submucous fibrosis, head and neck radiotherapy. So I remember the causes like first of all is the TMD and the TM joint derangement. So these two are quite similar. Then the infections, uh, in the infection, so it would come like pericoronitis, spreading infection, peritonsillar. 
okay and uh, after the infection the surgery and the radiotherapy they are bit similar uh, bit similar because they are one of the uh, treatment modalities then the tetanus and acute dystonic reactions and oral submucous fibrosis they are bit similar and the hematoma so i uh, just try to you know make your own um way to just that you will remember these things and it would come to your mind whenever you saw any you see any question in exam or whenever you are practicing accurately determining the cause of trismus requires how can you find out what is causing the trismus in your patient by taking thorough history by doing the examination and sometimes you may also need to do the imaging promptly um initiating management can improve outcome so as soon as uh, sooner you act on it the better would be the outcome management is tailored to the cause and may include dental treatment physiotherapy or the use of passive range of motion devices so it can vary what is the cause of the trismus patients with ongoing trismus it requires prompt specialist referral to investigate less common causes example malignancies involving the tmj or masticatory muscles or scleroderma okay so if there is any ongoing trismus then you need to refer the patient promptly to the specialist ongoing trismus means you have still tried some conservative method or still the patient's trismus is not getting better so then you need to refer him urgently to the specialist then we will start the uh, next topic it is very very important dental management of patients with medical conditions because most of the patient and most of the scenario that you will see in the exam the patient would be having so many medical condition and he would be taking so many medications so what you can do and how you can perform a dental treatment and at what time which type of dental treatment so it would be all uh, given in this uh, in this following pages so patient attending a general dentist practice can have medical conditions or be taking some medications that affect their dental management it is important to obtain a complete medical and medication history so there is no doubt in this you should be very sure about patient's medical condition and medication history before even touching him for patients with a medical condition consider the potential effect of dental treatment on their condition if the patient can only tolerate short periods of dental treatment or their medical condition is easily destabilized modify dental treatment accordingly for patients with complex medical conditions schedule appointment in the morning so the morning treatment uh, appointments are better why it is better because if there is any potential sequel happen it can be resolved during the day time okay that's the reason morning appointments are good one and if the patient's uh, medical condition can uh, you know easily get destabilized then you need to change the dental treatment if uh, the patient's life expectancy is short or if they have severe disease consider whether dental treatment will improve the patient's quality of life and level of pain consult the ma patient's medical practitioner specialist or multidisciplinary team to determine an appropriate treatment plan for acute oral and dental conditions the following topics outline common medical condition and medication and the dental issues associated with them there are not a substitute uh, for forming training for formal training or detailed tests medical emergencies can arise during the dental treatment so you need to call 000 and you need to administer the first aid first of all we are starting with the topic which is the anti thrombotic drug so if your patient is taking the anti thrombotic drug which might be oral anticoagulants 
or the injectable anticoagulants or the antiplatelet drugs so how you can your management can vary uh, patients taking antithrombotic drugs are at increased risks of prolonged bleeding associated with an because they are taking antithrombotic so the thrombus would not be formed so then uh, it can be related with increased bleeding with the dental procedure before any oral or dental procedure take a comprehensive medical and medication history including doses and indications when have they taken the medication and how many doses particularly note the use of anticoagulant or antiplatelet drug including non prescribed aspirin as well you need to find out which total do uh, drugs that patient is taking and any other drug with antithrombotic effects, for example, NSAIDs or any complementary medicines, because they can also uh, have the potency of increasing the bleeding. So you need to find out thorough medical and medication history. When planning an oral or dental procedure in a patient taking an antithrombotic drug, you need to weigh the potential harm of continuing a drug and may increase that may increase the risk of prolonged bleeding against the risk of that stopping the drug could cause a thromboembolic event. Okay, so these antithrombotic drugs are given to stop the formation of the thrombus. Okay, so that the thrombus won't form. So because we are um uh, we uh, we want to solve the problem of the stroke that we do not want that our patient get stroke because of that thrombus. That's the reason the patient is taking this medication. But on the other hand, as a side effect, this medication can increase the bleeding. If we perform any procedure, for example, we need to perform the extraction on this patient, then there would be higher risk of bleeding as compared to the normal individual who is not taking this drug. So we need to weigh the harm and the benefit in that case. Many common dental procedures have a lower risk of bleeding and the consequences of a thromboembolic event are usually more significant than the consequence of bleeding. So they say that even though we need to weigh the consequences, but still the uh, the danger of stock or the, the danger of uh, thromboembolic event is more harmful as compared to the bleeding. However, bleeding can be unexpected and potentially life-threatening as well. Temporary interruption of antithrombotic therapy is sometimes necessary to reduce the risk of prolonged bleeding. Sometimes we may need to re uh, stop the th uh, antithrombotic therapy uh, and we will discuss in detail in what cases we can stop it. But temporary interruption of antithrombotic therapy should only be done in consultation with the clinician managing the drug. Okay, so... Uh, here it is very simple because if you have not prescribed that medication to the patient, you cannot do anything. You are just dealing with his teeth, right? So you cannot ask your patient to stop that medication. So you need to talk to his GP or his uh, specialist, whoever has prescribed that medication to him, that I need to proceed with this uh, procedure, what precautions I need to take, and is that a chance that we can stop the medication for today morning and then we will start again later okay then you need to find out the risk assessment for patient taking antithrombotic drugs and undergoing an oral and dental procedure you need to find out if your patient is at higher risk or at the lower risk of getting the problems Risk assessments for a patient taking antithrombotic therapy before an oral or dental procedure include you need to see the properties of the antithrombotic drug, like which type of uh, antithrombotic drug they are taking, like we will read in detail here. Then patient-related bleeding risk factors. You need to find out, first you need to find out what is the what is the property of drug that they would take? 
then how is the patient's body patient related bleeding risk factor which we will read in this table and then procedural related then what you are planning to do on the patients then we will read in this table and the likely clinical effect of bleeding or thrombosis should it occur so you need to weigh after determining all these three things firstly how is the drug the properties of the drug then how is patient's body and patient related factor and the procedure related factor even after that you find that it's, it's fine to go for the procedure then you can proceed to assess periprocedural bleeding risk, dentists need to obtain an accurate medical and medication history, which may require consultation with the patient's medical practitioner. So you need to ask their GP uh, whether it is safe to proceed with the extraction or not, or what uh, precautions we may need to take. Risk assessment also includes an assessment of the patient's overall capacity to provide an accurate medical history, understand and consent to the procedure, and understand and adhere to post-procedural care requirements. Then clinical judgment is required from both the dentist and the clinician managing the antithrombotic drug to determine if temporary interruption is necessary so they they have written this line i think quite a few times that they want you to understand you should not stop their medication this is the duty of their um, medical practitioner their gp okay then we will start from this topic like the drug properties and all these pages we will read tomorrow all right. Thank you so much, guys, for watching my video and supporting me. Thank you.